Yeah, I think this is kind of intuitive. This is, I was looking for something and I prayed actually. And this is interesting because my family is completely not religious. Now I knew I was looking for something and I knew something was out there. I didn't know what it was. And uh, when I was 15, something interesting happened. I went to my best friend's mother's timeshare on the Gold Coast apartment. We were coming back to Brisbane and her windscreen got broken. When her windscreen got broken, we went to a bookstore where we waited for it to get fixed. And it was a new age bookstore called the Bodhi Tree Bookstore in a place called Kulangada. Now, I didn't learn anything about Buddhism, but there was this lady in the shop who was this kind of new age hippie kind of person, and there were these crystals. And she said, yeah, if you hold on to these stones and you'll get the sense for which one is for you. And, and different stones at different times. Then, you know, you need to use different ones and they'll, they'll help you to heal. And, and she taught me white light meditation, which was really helpful at the time. She said, yeah, you, you interested in meditation? Yeah, I'm interested in meditation. So what you do is you lie down on your bed, and you just imagine white light, and you fill your heart with white light, and you just wash away all the, and you just relax, and, and you put yourself in a white bubble, she said. And uh, so that was the beginning of my meditation practice. I did that every day, from the day she taught me. And, uh, and I, there were days when I was about to leave, and I'm like, oh, I haven't put myself in my white bubble yet, so. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the thing is, there's probably been some summative practice in past lives, visualizing light or whatever, but I was interested and I was looking for something. And there were days when I didn't do it where I could feel that I felt dirty. I hadn't washed my aura. Yeah. It really felt like that. At 15, so right. you must have practiced for a few lives. I don't know. But then something started to happen. Like I got accepted to go to university and I didn't go because I knew it was wrong. And I, I actually lied to my parents. I told them I deferred, but it was a course that you couldn't defer on. You just had to reject it. I rejected it and I told my parents I deferred for a year and I'm going to save up money. I didn't save up any money and uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I, I went to the Hare Krishnas actually. No, because when I was 15, does Melbourne have this? I'm sure you do. You have the kind of civic pride festival where there's a parade or something. So Brisbane has one of those, it's called Warana. And so I remember we were going to a movie and it was a Warana parade and the movie was Cannonball Run with Burt Reynolds. And I was there with my mum and I was there with my big sister and I was there with my twin brother and my younger brother. And so we were watching the parade first and then we were going to watch the Cannonball Run. And so the Hare Krishnas came by without their shoes and with their little bells and their shaved heads and their saffron robes and Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. And I was looking at them, at them and they had, this, they had a quality of radiance which I was very interested in and a quality of joy. I remember looking at them and looking at my mum and looking at them and looking at my brothers and I really wanted to go with them. I really wanted to go with Hare Krishna. So I started going to the Hare Krishna restaurant at, at 15 and they have the vegetarian meal and the teaching and actually dancing with them and chanting with them and stuff on Sunday. And, but I couldn't quite buy the doctrine that you'd get born as some milkmaid and get to live with this blue god in heaven and forever. I liked the chanting and stuff, but it didn't, the philosophy, and I, I couldn't quite buy it. I'm sure I didn't understand it correctly, but that's my memory of... So I didn't join the Hare Krishnas. I thought about it a lot. When I was back in high school, I was thinking, well, maybe I should join the Hare Krishnas. Yeah. <laughs> didn't enjoy school. But I started to pray. This is, this is actually a little interesting and I think what it was was this is my belief in devas because I think they help you how they can where you are they need to know what you want so I was like just searching what am I going to do with my life what am I going to do with my life and I was doing this white light visualization one day I was in Maya department store and there was a book on the bookshelf and it was glowing white light I'm not lying I'm like, that's really weird, that book's glowing. And it was called Reaching for the Other Side. And it was by some new age guru called Dawn Hill. And, I, and so I didn't have any money and my friend lent me the money. Twenty dollars. And in this book it had a prayer, which was, and I'd never been, I'd never had any particular affinity with Christianity, but it had a prayer to Christ. 
And they said, if you want a spiritual guide and if you want your life guided, you have to pray and you should pray to Christ. And I didn't have anything else. I can still remember the prayer because I did it every day. It was, in the name of Christ, I call upon the spirits of light to stand guard at the doorway of my soul, to protect me from the forces of darkness and delusion and lead me along a path of love, light and truth. And so I started adding that to my white light meditation. And uh, somebody said, at a coffee shop, I said, uh, you like meditation, you should do the Goenka Vipassana retreat. That was in Brisbane. Uh, when I moved to Sydney and I was working in another coffee shop, two people in that coffee shop had done the Goenka Vipassana retreat. And they said, you should do the Goenka Vipassana retreat. So I did. And that was my introduction to Buddhism. And I was thinking it was going to be like lying on the bed visualizing white light. <laughs> Oh. It's the hardest thing I did in my life. You have to sit nine hours of meditation a day on the floor. I'd never sat on the floor in my life. They, they're a bit uh, kinder these days. They let people sit in chairs and things. Do they? Yeah. Okay. Because my teacher did it and he knew it was going for himself. And wow. he said he, uh, no, he was monk. And he said he couldn't meditate because there were all these Western women screaming out, they literally screaming in the pain. Mm. <laughs> but, um, apparently it's, it's, um, They're more reasonable. it's more reasonable now. Oh, I was incredibly painful. I remember, but that changed my life because that's what completely reoriented my life because it was all just pain. Knee pain, back pain, shoulder pain, and going up, start again, start again. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but this effort of just trying, just trying to start again, you know, thank you, going up very much, going up starting again, starting again, starting again. It was like day seven that all of the pain disappeared and there was a feeling of coolness and there was a feeling of fullness in the heart, a certain quality of fullness that I'd never felt. And there was this recognition, that's what I'm looking for. And it lasted about three seconds and then all that pain came back. <laughs> but it was so nice and I had never felt that well that peaceful, that full, that content. And then, then I really started to pay attention to what he was saying in those recorded talks in the evening. And he was saying, if you want the results of meditation, you need to practice every morning, every day, an hour in the morning, an hour at night. It's like anything, just like athletes train, meditators have to train. It doesn't come easily, nobody says it's easy. And I heard him and I made a commitment. And, but it was like an hour in the morning and an hour at night for maybe three months. Then it became an hour once a day. Then it became 40 minutes, then it became, 20 minutes, but in that period of time I was already seeing something. I still wasn't yet studying Buddhism, but I knew it was Buddhist methods and he talked about the Buddha a lot. I wasn't convinced about precepts at all at that stage. I was thinking how I understood what was okay by sexual conduct was if they want to do it and you want to do it, it's okay. <laughs> that was my first interpretation of sexual misconduct. Now I'm strictly celibate and happily so. But and alcohol, I wasn't that into it, but there was just oh, one drink or whatever. But you, you justify your kilesa. And it's only when you keep them for a period of time that you really see the benefit. And so I think the merit of doing that daily meditation practice, I literally walked, I walked out of the coffee shop where I used to work with Yong, Abby's husband. We were working at the same vegan cafe in Glebe. And uh, I walked out of there, and this is, I think, a pass I path I have it as well, was I, I was so fed up with myself, like I was trying to live, I was trying to be happy, I was trying to be happy and I was trying to be not too materialistic and I was a vegan and so my recipe for happiness was you should go to the beach a couple times a week, should see a movie, should eat nice food, should have sex and I was miserable, I was richly miserable and so one of the things I hated was because I used, to, I used to swim two kilometers three times a week, that was another, it was like a beginning of a meditation practice, I think, it was because that, uh, counting the breath and you're in the pool for 40 minutes. And so I had a fairly attractive body swimming two kilometers three times a week. And I was jogging and I was doing aerobics and boxing training as well, it was ridiculous. And uh, I was miserable. And the thing that really used to bug me was people thought I was a happy person. Because I had this practice of being kind, I was serving people their food, hi, how are you, They're being nice. And in, inside, when I was at my, in my studio apartment, I was really miserable and really depressed. 
And I hated the uh, disingenuousness. I hated that people thought I was happy. You made a nice girl. I met, I met many nice people. But this is... <laughs> no, this is part of this. This is the thing. I, there's got to have been some wisdom there because there was that in me that... Let's suppose one is with a beautiful person and I noticed that... Cause I fell in love several times. And I noticed that there's a certain point where you don't love them as much as you did at first. And what is it that noticed that? And then I've noticed that this person is really attractive and a very nice person. But you start to think about someone else even while you're having sex with them. And so I was really confused. It's like I've been told that this romance myth, if you find someone who's attractive and beautiful and you're with them and you love them, you'll be happy. And I notice, but I don't love them as much as I did last week. And I'm already starting to think about someone else. And I had this feeling, this is not love. I don't know what it is, but it's not love. And I wasn't proud of it, I was disgusted by it. And I was very confused. I was like, how, how come it works for other people? How come other people can fall in love and, and be happy, but myself, you know, it wasn't working. And so I was very confused about it. And now I understand, you know, there is love, but there is other things, isn't there, in the sexual act. There is, we understand karma raga, sexual passion, sexual lust, it's a kilesa. And, uh, but there was, anyway, there was that in me that was noticing these things and experimenting, and I was not pleased with my life. And so I had to clean this uh, restaurant, and I came out of the restaurant one day, and I was so, I was so defeated, I had to just admit that I, I didn't know how to be happy. But I looked heavenward, I looked to the sky, and I, I made this plea or prayer. Okay, I admit it, I don't know how to be happy. And then I made, this, I made a kind of a determination, I said, just looking skyward, about 11 o'clock at night, if you show me signs, lead me on the path towards true happiness, I promise I'll follow. And I meant it, I really meant it. I don't know who I was talking to, but I meant it. And then interesting things started to happen. A few days later, somebody forgot their copy of the Lonely Planet Guide to Thailand at the restaurant. And I picked it up and I read and noticed that 95% of Thailand is Buddhist. And I was thinking, I was starting to think, maybe I should go backpacking, maybe I should go traveling, like Australians do when they're young. And so, a couple of weeks later, it was payday, and in those days we got it in an envelope as cash. And I took out my wallet, and I was taking out the money, and I noticed this coin I'd never seen in my wallet. And I asked my friend, what's this? It had like little stupas, and it actually had the Thai king on it. And I was like, what's this? She said, that's, that's five baht, that's Thai money. I'd never seen it before. Uh, oh, and I noticed the book, and now the money. Mm -hmm. The thing that was the clincher for me, was I used to clean the fryer, and the fryer was Dorf brand. What country is that made in? Dorf. Oh, Germany. Germany, okay. And the restaurant was Japanese-inspired vegan food. But there was this little pipe that was made out of galvanized iron, and I used to have to clean the fryer once a week late at night. And I'd never noticed this. I'd been doing it for a year. And so I'd already made, I'd already made my vow, and I'd already had these two signs. I'm putting on this pipe late at night. My eyes are blurry, and I'm filtering the filtering the oil. There's one word on this pipe, I've never noticed it before, in English, Thailand. Now why on earth the, the galvanized pipe bit was made in Thailand, I have no idea. Didn't even say made in Thailand, just said Thailand. And I made a vow, okay, within 10 weeks I'm going to Thailand. And I, so I got my passport and I I uh, tried to save up money, and I couldn't. And it was like two weeks before I had to go. I had no money. I had my passport, but I had no money. So I sold my bed, I sold my computer, I sold my mountain bike. I sold everything. I sold my carpet. I had a Turkish rug. I sold everything I could. And I got $1,000, which was quite a bit in those days, 20 years ago. And uh, I think it's about four days before I left this, working at this restaurant, this woman walked in. She said, is there a job? And I said, well, I'm leaving, so give us your details, maybe there is. And she said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to Thailand. She said, I just came from Thailand yesterday. 
And she said, why are you going? And I said, uh, I want to go to the beach. It was coming up to winter. And I'm interested in Buddhism. She said to me, I know where there's a meditation center on an island with a view of the ocean. And she gave me the address. She walked into where I worked and gave me the address. So I spent nine months in Thailand. It was the first overseas country I ever went to. I spent nine months there. And I spent five months at that meditation center. And the teachers were Westerner and they were teaching in English. Methods that they, they were doing 10-day retreats. And they had this program that you would sit one retreat and help them with the next retreat. Sit one retreat. So I think I did three or four of theirs and I helped them three or four. And over a nine month period I spent five months at their center. And that's when I think things really changed because they required that you keep the precepts. And I couldn't help noticing that, although I had my own opinions about alcohol and sex, I couldn't help noticing that when I was refraining, I felt better. And when I was meditating, you had to meditate twice a day. So for me, I think a combination of many fortunate karmas that got me to that place. And there's another thing as well, like if that was a meditation in Australia, I don't think I could have done it. It was something about the exoticness, these tropical storms, these coconuts, these, these nuns. I used to work, there was these really fun old nuns and they were really funny and they used to tease me and I used to peel the coconuts for them and they used to make the coconut curry but they used to like spank me and things. They were very funny. And uh, like 70 year old ladies. And, uh, <laughs> they're always naughty, they just give me a little spank. You know? But there was that kind of grandmother like cantankerous kind of just funny, they were funny. And uh, so it was a combination of views of the sea, beautiful sunsets, amazing tropical storms, funny nuns, and being away from Australia where I was miserable. And all of that allowed the mind to sober up from keeping strict, strict precepts. And then I had to redo my visa in Malaysia. And I broke a couple of precepts. And I came back and I, and I had to not, I just had to admit it's true. You think that when you do this, you'll feel better because there's certain pressures building up and you don't. You're actually less happy. And I, I could compare my mind state before I went for the visa run and when I came back from the visa run and I had to admit it. I mean, it looks like the Buddha might have known what he was talking about. Da -da. <laughs> and so combination of many factors that... Uh, and then I realized that um, I wanted to meditate a lot this lifetime. I didn't want to go back to Australia, but I ran out of money. And, uh, but I learned massage in Chiang Mai during that period of time. That came in incredibly handy because that's how I got these really good stories out of Ajahn Anand by being able to massage. <laughs> and <laughs> that was very handy. But um, I came back to Australia and I was sitting in Sydney. It sounds a bit dramatic, but... I would wake up and before I was fully awake I was already crying. That's how much I missed Thailand. And there was this real sense of... Because I, as a child I had this feeling that I was born in the wrong place. And when I, I had this feeling from a young age, I was looking at my family and I was just kind of thinking, no, <laughs> wrong place. <laughs> and I do have a twin brother. Not close at all. We shared rooms and we didn't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty chatty. He didn't like me much. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I just this kind of really disoriented feeling of, and I'm even my name. I uh, I thought this isn't my name. Lydia can probably identify a pathology. <laughs> but then anyway, I came to Thailand and I was on this island and I went jogging and I still remember the moment where I was by myself and I was around this hill and I was jogging and I stopped and I was looking at the sea and I was standing on this land and I felt, oh, this feels like home. Very interesting. And then that's what made it possible to stay a longer time, nine months. My first trip overseas was nine months. and. Uh, when I came back, I would say, I would wake up, I was already weeping with, uh, oh, I want to go back. So an interesting thing happened. Uh, a friend of mine, he said, I see how you've changed from these meditation retreats. I want to go and do one of those retreats. And he said, uh, I don't want to wait for you to save up the money, so I'll offer you the plane ticket. And then my best friend at the time, she was studying shiatsu and other things, and because uh, we were part of that kind of yoga, hippie, vegan crowd. 
she, and she needed a place in town. She said, I'll rent your apartment, because I just set up my apartment and I just started massaging at the hospice and I was trying to have this kind of Buddhist, Buddhist lifestyle in Sydney. And uh, she said, I'll rent your apartment. And this other guy said, I'll offer you your ticket. And so uh, within about 10 weeks, I was back, back there again. And it was on the second trip that somebody told me that there's a monastery for people who speak English in Ubon Rajatani. And so I went there and I, yeah, it felt cool and it felt good, but I never thought that I, I never thought that I could be a monk. I, I just thought that I'd like to, but I never thought I'd be able to keep the rules. But what I, what I, I had this experience of, when I was there, I had this experience of meeting people who really wanted to be, but they had obstruction. People had to go back and finish university, or someone was putting their brother through university, or someone's parent was sick and they were taking care of them. And, and I kept, and I really believed in karma and rebirth. And I had to notice something. I had to notice all these people that wanted this opportunity, that there were obstructions. And then I noticed, I don't have a debt. I have five brothers and sisters, my mum and, and dad are healthy. Here there is a monastery where they're teaching in English, where they'll do your visa for you, where you're welcome to stay as a guest a long time. And I, I had this feeling of this has to be the result of many lives of good karma and even must have prayed for the opportunity and I had this sense of I can't, even though I don't feel like I can do it, I, I can't walk away from it. I had that, that feeling. And I also knew my artistic character. I had the kind of a sense that I'd either be very good or very not good, judging by what I've seen so far. And so it really felt like a choice. Okay, heaven and beyond or hell. I thought, oh, okay, I guess I'm going to try for heaven, heaven and beyond. <laughs> it wasn't easy. Three o'clock morning rise and uh, walking on sharp stones. In those days, they hadn't yet concreted the road. It's like five kilometers of sharp stones on bare feet on an empty stomach. And then the bowl's full of sticky rice. And in these days, they've got someone waiting at the corner and you can empty your bowl out. And those days, it didn't. You, and these days, they have people keeping eight presets walking behind. And, in those days, sometimes you had, sometimes you didn't. So you had to carry your Ajahn's bowl, and you've got about five kilograms of glutinous rice in one bowl, and the strap's there, and you've got the other bowl, and the strap's there. So this experience of being strangled and suffocating, every footstep hurts, and you have to get back, and you've come from the beautiful life of the vegan cafe with all the huggy types. I didn't, I didn't like the monks either. They were so... I know, I look back at it, I don't know how I survived actually. Well, I made a few good friends, and Ajahn Pasana was very, very kind to me, I was very lucky. But many of the monks, I just thought they're kind of cranky and critical and smelly. And uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't particularly impressed. So were they all Vista? Yeah, mostly. And they were always, they were always on about, that's right, that's wrong. They always loved telling what was wrong about everything. Oh, I just found it so boring. They, they seemed to find that really interesting, but I found it really boring. That's not quite right, you know, and that's not quite nice like to argue about Buddhist philosophy and stuff. And I just wanted to be peaceful. And uh, so I was pretty miserable. But then the abbot, I became his attendant, and he was very kind to me. And I, then I ended up with a good friend who was a monk from England, Ajahn Punyo. So once I had a good friend and the abbot was kind to me, it was, that definitely helped. And then I, I told you I went to the Emerald Buddha and asked for help. I'm going to need more help to get through this. And then not long after I met Ajahn Anand, that was enormously helpful. But there's a, there's a few things there. I'm willing to share that story because to, to point out, obviously, there's principles there as well. Like, one, there's a sincere aspiration, isn't there? Like, when I was actually looking for something, yeah. when people said, you should go and do this retreat, I did. And I tried it, and it was really, really difficult. But I was willing to, I was looking, and I was willing to do it. And then when Goenka said, you should meditate every day, I did. And then when I said, okay, if you send me signs, I'll follow them, they sent the signs, I followed. And so there was a sincerity. But there's obviously also got to be a certain amount of supportive merit so that when you pray and ask for help, something responded. So I'm very grateful. That has to come. Ajahn Bliyan, when he went to Lumpur Bliyan, who's believed to be an Arahant, when he went to Wat Nanachat, he was talking to the monks and he said, all of you here have been monks before. So I, I suspect that's the case. So I don't think, I don't think I'm special for having been a monk in previous lives. I just understand that to be the case for all of us. 
that if you're from another country and you get all the way to a, a monastery and you go forth as a monk, there has to be yeah. some auspicious, supportive circumstance. So. And you felt like you were not, you just didn't belong here. Right, mm. wrong place, yeah. And I felt at home in Thailand, even though I was a head taller than everybody and that I did feel more at home. You can't speak the language, it's quite difficult the first few years. And similarly in India, I do feel quite at home in India. You know, after being with you a few days, when you when you teach us Dhamma, you're a different person. Yeah, I, I thought you're different. You know, you know, it's it's coming from a wisdom. It's coming from a different. Person. She's saying ordinarily I have no wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I know what you're saying. No, the the, the thing is. Monks have their personality, and, and we're supposed to. We're, we're not supposed to be in this archetypal teacher mode all the time. But when, I, when I'm when i teaching, I set the intention to teach the very best I can, and I, you know, honor of what my teachers taught me. So there's a lot of respect for the Dhamma, and respect for my teachers, and then respect for your sincere aspiration. So I try to rise to the occasion. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Did, did um, Ajahn Anandini sense like you had these lines where you know you were a monk? Yeah, that was the thing when I was really struggling and he said it's like you're in this house it's on fire and there's nowhere to go but if you just keep patiently enduring the house is on fire but you'll have a place where you can rest and be aware of it. And then I asked him am I trainable and he said you have merit and said it very emphatically it was very, very helpful. It could, could come from somewhere, but it wasn't until I went and lived with him that I could ask more questions. And Did he give you a sense? Was that, were they consecutive lives, or were they quite... He didn't tell you me... You sort of a life where you're kind of doing a holy life, and then you have a life where other karma's kicking in, and then you Yeah, he didn't get that detailed. Yeah. And he only told me one thing per occasion, and then you'd have to wait <laughs> a good chunk of time. It's not like, a, not like tea leaves and tarot cards. <laughs> giving you a, a, you know, your past life regression thing. It's a, he, you know, he has to be very careful because if he tells that too publicly, then everybody wants to know that. Mm -hmm. And he could end up being like this, you know, fortune teller that has to tell people about their past life. So he's, he's very discreet. And now even more than before, now that he's quite famous, he's more careful about, I'm sure his abilities are even better, but he does he shares less. But he would say things more like, because he wanted to affirm what I was doing, he said, you, he would just say, you have a lot of merit. And I'm like, why? And he says, do you, you don't know how lucky you are to have met Ajahn Chah's teaching and Ajahn Chah's community. And that must have merit as a cause. So he would make more like statements like that. And he said, how many people in the world have met this training and come from another country? So he would say things like that, but it was very skillful because it was also affirming the value of what I was doing and where I was, rather than saying I was special. Mm -hmm. And it was only when I was much closer to him that, that I, I asked if I was a monk before. And he did. No, I actually had a dream. I was actually practicing at Ajahn Dunn's monastery and uh, I was practicing very hard and I wasn't getting any rapture or any peacefulness. And I got frustrated, I was thinking, because you know, like everybody, I want amazing results quickly. And uh, I got frustrated, and so I made this vow before sleeping. I said, oh, if, I, if I can't get jhana, or if I can't get enlightened, may I at least dream of a past life? And uh, just before I woke up in the morning, I saw this monk in a dream walking towards me. And he was, funny enough, he was a white-colored monk, and he had these bluey-green eyes. In this dream, I knew it was Afghanistan 1,500 years ago. And this monk's walking towards me and I was like, I know him, I know him, who is it, who is it, oh, who is it? And I woke up and I was like, it's me. There's this incredible feeling of intimacy, of knowing that, that bhikkhu. And so I, I asked Ajahn, and when I went back to what my I had this dream, and he said, yeah, yeah, yep, old memories. So, uh, but it, it isn't, you, you have to work for these things, so you have to meet him halfway. And you say, well, I had this experience, and can you confirm something? And he would say, yeah. Okay, let's dedicate Mary.